Hello, everybody, and welcome to Four Wheel Tech for October 20th, 2024. It's season one, episode 24, and I am Merwat, and along with sentient AI from the future as co host, we're going to talk about a rubberized Cybertruck, a 300 horsepower BMW priced like a Civic, uh, the built for the road Ferrari, and uh, car terms we've said incorrectly. And then finally, boring cars. Everything's powered by hometown.com that we even have a channel. It's set up primarily. There's 50 channels over on hometown.com. And this one here is called four wheel tech, and it focuses on automotive technology, automotive technology and technology that's associated with um, automotive industry. That's not where we get all of our information from because something could be somewhere else. So we have a bunch of other categories here and a whole lot of content. So go over and sign up hometown.com, become a citizen, and you too can peruse all of the headlines and the little snippets that we get from all of our sources that we talk about here for Will Tech. Just one of six weekly shows, and we have a daily show called Non Sequitur News, which covers the whole gamut of hometown.com that said see you on the other side of the intro all right folks let's get into the first article but first hello sentient ai from the future hello mayor watt and hello hometown citizens thanks for joining us for four wheel tech today so we only have five articles now. We Our show is only 30 minutes long, only 30 minutes long. We sometimes run a little long because uh, Mayor Watt likes to jump up on the soapbox. Um, or we get into a discussion, uh, the sentient AI and myself. But this first one is about, well, it's in Reality Hacker. And we are in a weird reality, that's for sure. A rubberized Cybertruck is plowing through European pedestrian safety rules. Tesla's troubled Cybertruck pickup is illegal in Europe, yet somehow a barely modified model has found a way to get a license. A group of European transport organizations claim this ride could spell disaster. Yeah, the article's over in Wired.com. Carlton Reed is the author of this. The sentient AI is maybe okay. I'm not quite sure. Okay. Um, so it says the European uh, New Car Assessment Program, or Euro NCAP, has not yet measured, prodded, weighed, or smashed a Tesla Cybertruck. It hasn't happened in the United States either. Exactly. It's like the, the uh, vehicle with the most recognized um, model. It has a lot of visibility and nobody knows has the safety anything right. on it. Yeah. But if you slam its door, then the insides fall off. But that's okay. And the metal on or the outside. Or you might harm your hands. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's basically a dumpster fire, if you ask me. But um, so they haven't smashed a Tesla Cybertruck or checked whether pedestrians could survive a hit from this angular beast. But um, um, Musk says that the electric pickup truck might potentially score poorly on the test anyway. I'm not even sure what that means, but it's a piece of junk. So based on well, only... also the angles and probably the height, et cetera, are going to be a threat to pedestrians anyway. Yeah, the size, the weight, the angles, the location of those angles, all of it. We design around pedestrian strikes. We really do. We require a certain amount of lighting. We requi require the angle of the bumper be at a certain location. The F-150 is an anomaly for crying out loud. And our, but trucks, I think, are a little bit more um, outside the standard. They at least have standard. some rules about what they can be, but they're also a threat to pedestrians sometimes. Yeah, these big ass trucks that are out there. So based only on the car's visual appearance, there are several aspects of the vehicle that look like they may be a threat to pedestrians, mainly that they are a Gintu knife flying down the road with 8,000 pounds worth of battery and uh, little regard for humans. Thought you were going to say something. So it isn't a legal requirement to have cars um, 
get a Euro end cap task, but a low score is more than just a badge of dishonor. It's a turnoff for customers who tend to balk at buying cars that scrimp on safety. It really should be mandatory. And I mean, I would say this about any country because the US doesn't mandate it for all cars either. Right. Europe's tougher regulations make for safer cars, but though are for those inside and out designed to test how safe a car is in a crash, Euro and cap instantly cut through automaker safety claims with rigorous independent testing, hard facts, and an easy to understand five-star rating system. We have something similar to that here, but why is it not required? It's because there's buyer beware, uh, it, but it doesn't make sense because there are people out there that are driving this that have no regard for anybody else. Should they accidentally hit somebody, they think that they can spend enough money or just disregard the humanity of hitting a human being. Exactly. And I think in the U.S. they have a standard where they have to have so many sales. But, you know, I think there's less risk of an existing model that's been tested 15 times from previous versions not being right. tested immediately versus something that's a complete new design doesn't match up with historical cars or trucks. Yep. For example, a budget, a Dacia or Dacia Spring EV that they recently reviewed over at Wired or BBC, must be Wired, um, costs an attractive $19,000 if it were sold in the US. Yet that low price impacts the safety rating, resulting in a poor one star end cap rating. Yeah, because yeah, they maybe they need to change the rules about what needs to be tested. Yeah, still, it takes a particular kind of customer to buy a car knowing that it has a low safety rating for the occupants and potential Mad Max style lethality to those outside the vehicle. The kind of customer who would buy mm, a Cybertruck. At least one Cybertruck has been seen driving around in cities in the Czech Republic. An EU member with a group of uh, transport non-governmental organizations warning that Musk's polarizing EV with a troubled development history is too bulky and sharp to be allowed on European roads. 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 The approval and registration of Cybertrucks in the EU poses illegal risks to all other road users. Um, says an open letter from the NGOs to the European Commission and national uh, vehicle authorities across Europe. Small number of Cybertrucks registered so far in the EU need to be deregistered with the relevant member states confirming their removal from public roads. Signed by the leaders, among others, of the European Transport Safety Council and the International Federation of Pedestrians, which I, there's a federation for pedestrians. I thought I that's no society idea. Um, in the European Cyclist Federation. Yeah, so well, that's true. They're definitely a danger to cyclists as well. But it would seem that maybe they have some laws about what the dimensions of the cars can be. I mean, Europe is known for its narrow road. Yeah, and uh, arguably it can't handle the seismic shift of these vehicles on the roads because they're not built to support 8,000 pound vehicles plus, you know. Referencing this modification, they said the EU motor uh, directives prohibit sharp edges on cars. James May is actually seen in a picture and I actually watched this. James May um, said that the the edges of, of the Cybertruck are extraordinarily sharp. Um, so check authorities required ultra low or sorry ultra narrow rubber slats to be retrofitted to the cybertruck approved in early july such a retrofitting process would not meet eu rules prohibiting sharp edges in the first place so yeah i mean it's basically a, a, a dull knife edge of a vehicle if a human hits this or gets hit by this um they're going to be severely harmed well, even in another car, that's going to do significant damage. I mean, obviously, it's more concerning with a pedestrian. Yeah. So the EU motor directives also require speed limiters on vehicles that weigh more than 3.5 metric tons when full. Tesla's manual lists the steel vehicle as having a gross vehicle weight of 4 metric tons. Again, 8,000 pound vehicle. Since it's not destined for Europe, we wouldn't test the Cybertruck, states Euro NCAPS Avery. 
He adds that another stumbling block is that the Cybertruck has no type approval. EU type approval means confirmation that production samples of design meet specified performance standards set by the European Commission's automotive uh, directives. But it's an EU um, member, uh, Czech Republic um, is an EU member state. So it should be abiding by, uh, arguably, everybody goes their own right. way a little bit. But Do you think this is also like, hey, US, would you test it already? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it just seems like here in the States, it's, you know, whatever, do whatever you want. And you have to kill enough people for it to actually draw attention that there's some build problem. But we just see seen a recent one where the um, the full self-driving hit somebody, hit a pedestrian because it was blind. The the car couldn't right, see. It was a Tesla, of, right? It wasn't a Cybertruck. It was a Tesla. Yeah. Um, so we don't really test anything unless somebody really wants that designation as a safe vehicle. You know, certain cars, Toyota goes out of their way. I think Mazda goes out of their way. But these ex more exotic cars, they don't require it, so they don't do it. Well, and of course, they might not like the results if they did get tested. Yeah, they definitely won't. And I think that this is stupid. This little rubber gasket around the perimeter isn't going to do jack shit. Um, it looks like the step on a Cybertruck might create bending moments uh, that could be injurious. We have an upper leg that is fired from the bonnet edge. Again, you would want energy absorbing structures without protrusion. I can see the exaggerated corner and the general stiffness of the Cybertruck stainless steel uh, compromising this flex. Because like if you get hit by somebody, if you get hit by a car here, certain cars, they're at a certain level, low height so that you bounce onto the hood and you don't basically hit a brick wall. They're also not sharp. So you roll more over the edge instead of this thing acting like a Swiss army knife and just dicing you up. Um, but the other Tesla doesn't seem to be like that, except that it's just extraordinarily heavy and it, it full self-driving is not accurate. It's not, it can be blinded by a mist for crying out loud and sun and whatever else. There was a bunch of processes. Fog, that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Fog. So the Czech ministry, uh, transport ministry did not see the discrepancy as an issue because the registration was individual approval of a vehicle from the national scope only on the territory of the Czech Republic. Again, it's because I said, well, they're a member state. They should be following EU regulations. But they said it's only a singular truck, not a, a full on process of. Right. And I guess they're saying they can't leave the country. The vehicle or the person? Hmm. Maybe both. Interesting. So, yeah, there's this one person that has to stand out. And, well, I mean, that's fine. Go ahead. I, it's an exotic car. That's fine. But somebody's right, going to get hurt by this thing. Well, and it's like, what's in it for the Czech Republic to approve this when it's clearly not mm. meeting the requirements? Never say no to the Musk. Let's move on. The next article is over in four wheel tech. You can buy a 300 horsepower BMW that looks like a Civic for the price of a Civic 2025 BMW Grand Coupe uh, on the horizon. The, the author says, and it's from Jalopnik, while they haven't figured out who exactly the customer is for this car, if you are the type that needs a BMW badge, but only has a Honda budget, then this might be the one. There's already some opportunities in the pre-owned market, they say, but this looks like a Civic, but it has 300 horsepower. The two series Grand Coupe, it's actually a four door. Tom McParland over at jalopnik.com put the article together. Um, I actually kind of It does like look car. like a Civic, but not the grill. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean the logo, but. Yeah. The whole front end looks BMW. Right. So. Um, 
So yeah, young professionals looking for an entry level lease on something with a luxury badge has shrunk over the years and buyers are nearly as hung up on prestige brands as they used to be. Uh, furthermore, most people want to opt for a small crossover, even though the Audi A3 offers a similar car with essentially the same formula, the two, uh, the uh, series two or the two series Grand Coupe um, always seemed a bit phoned in, especially when the two series coupe has been consistently pretty good. Front wheel drive platform for the two series Grand Coupe is actually based on a mini. Interesting. Interesting indeed. So nationwide, there are about 60 M235X drive units in the sub 35,000 price. Many of these have reasonable miles and even some have a BMW certified warranty. And most of these cars have had the original spec well over the $50,000 mark. So why would you get the Series 2, right? So the M235X drive Grand Coupe is a mouthful of a name, but offer a two liter turbocharged four that pumps out 302 horsepower with traction via BMW's X-Drive all-wheel drive system. Of course, you can opt for the 228 Grand Coupes that have 230 horsepower that come in either front or all-wheel drive, but the value score is in the BMW M upgraded trim. So there you have it. Um, let's see if they actually talk about this more. So when you consider a loaded Civic retails for about $33,000 an automatic Integra starts at around $34,000 and a WRX with some upgraded interior features like leather seats pushes to about $40,000. These higher powered compact BMWs could be worth a look. So there you go. $30,000. These are for used. A pretty new, right? They are used. The price is uh, where the used ones were below 35k well below 35k i mean this one is a 20 and these are very new like there was a 2022 model that went through there what's the difference between these two that there's a six thousand dollar probably the either the location a thousand miles less maybe the location Maybe one's in a higher price market or something. That's wild. Well, one's through a Land Rover dealer. That probably explains the price difference. <laughs> yeah, the Jaguar Land Rover um, dealership versus deluxe auto sales. I don't know. I like that one better. Although that one's pretty good too, but I don't want people to pay attention to me when I'm driving. I don't want to be on people's radar. Anyway. Pretty cool. Well, there you go, folks. 2025 BMW Grand Coupe on the horizon. So you can get a last year's model um, for cheaper. Let's keep going, though. Sound good? Sounds good. So this next article is over on Four Wheel Tech. A Ferrari F80 is a $4 million race car built for the road. It's the Ferrari F80. Let's go straight on over to the source. Ryan Eric King put this article together. Uh, for jalopnik.com that thing is it getting looks on the road really cool <laughs> but it's pretty low i would not want to go on any speed pumps man i just i can't imagine i've seen the shell of this kind of a car these supercars and it's impossible to get in there it looks very claustrophobic but the car looks cool so roomy yay um so ferrari's latest hypercar features technology pulled from his le mans and f1 winning machinery four million dollars main selling point is the badge and the passion associated with it ferrari plans on only producing 799 f80s four million dollar sticker price it doesn't qualify for superlatives in any particular metric oh wow geez um, so it has the F80's power unit produces an impressive 1,183 horsepower with 887 horsepower from combustion and 297 horsepower from electric power. So it's a hybrid three liter V6, a scaled up version of the configuration familiar to F1 fans. The machine has a dry weight of 3,362 pounds. So this thing weighs like a mini. Um, in fact, it's like you get the full racing seats, right? Like with the harness belt and everything. Yeah, the five point harness. 
Um, let me see. Yeah, it weighs as much. It weighs a 300 pounds more than a Mini Cooper. Ah, but probably less than a Cybertruck. Uh, yeah, well. Because <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking about that. It it weighs uh, about a third of the Cybertruck. So uh, I won't read the quotes. It, it basically just says that these... The hypercar shares many of its styling elements with Le Mans winning 499p. Those similarities are more than skin deep with F80. It's also fitted with a similar underfloor wing, front wing, to keep its nose on the ground. The powertrain is slightly tilted to create the space for a floor for a flat floor, aiding the F80's ground effects elements. Uh, paired with an active rear wing, the hypercar generates 2,200 pounds of downforce while going 155 miles per hour, and it's street legal. I, I can't imagine driving this I thing anywhere. No, I, I mean, can you imagine trying to take it somewhere like a grocery store or parking lot or something? Yeah, right. Speed bump anywhere. This thing gets put on a flatbed vehicle and driven to... Uh, a loop and right and that's it that's it test driven there it's pretty or maybe it goes to like a hot restaurant or something and then back home it can't even park in valet parking well no i get it but it seems like one of those cars that people would want to show off yeah for sure yeah um and maybe throw the keys to the first person that appears <laughs> i was actually to be... thinking about that <laughs> yeah Watch the first episode of Lincoln Lawyer if you haven't seen it. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. The next article is over in four-wheel tag. Uh, these are all the car terms that you've been saying wrong this whole uh, this whole time. While Americans might be better at hot sauces, Brits excel at music. Really? That's a bold assumption in both ways, I suppose. <laughs> we can all agree that both nations have some pretty weird words for car things tire with a Y versus tire with an I. Having come from Britain to America, I often find myself stuck between the two, regular typing aluminium instead of aluminum or tire with a Y instead of an I. So what else is in here? Oh, it's a whole slideshow. Um, so differences between the two runs deeper though. And there's a whole host of car terms over here that you'd be left out of a mechanic shop if you use them in the US. To save you from such embarrassment, they've worked through some of the most important automotive phrases. So let's take a look. So speed humps, trunk, crosswalk, blinker, station wagon, intersection, hood, beater, uh, traffic circle, idle, off ramp, coast, drive shaft, sidewalk, and junkyard. Those okay, are, would you say those are pretty commonly known in the U.S.? Yeah. Um, Most of them. Yeah, I don't know if people say traffic circle. No, I don't think that's a U.S. term at all. Um, I don't think we really say station wagon anymore. It doesn't really work. No, I mean, if it was an old car that was a station wagon, maybe, but I suspect... Younger generations don't even know what a station wagon is. Yeah. Beater is easy. I mean, people drive beaters all the time. Huh. I'm really curious. So let's see. So sure, there are humps in the road that stop you from speeding. So speed humps make sense. If you want to sound like a true motoring expert, it's best to call them sleeping policemen instead. Oh my God. That's an odd term for Americans to hear. Yeah. Um, so trunk I, in the, it's the boot, right? It's the boot. Yeah. So space has for your trunk or, or, or is it actually called a boot because of all the space it has for your boots? We may never know. They say that's okay. Never mind. I won't even try to explain somebody putting a massive. I don't know what that was about. <laughs> so a crosswalk is a crosswalk, right? Well, wrong across the pond, the. Um, there are pelican crossings, 
puffin crossings or even toucan crossings, but really a crosswalk should actually be called a zebra crossing. Da, da, da. Well, I wonder it, what the difference is between the types of crossings that are listed there. I think it's the designs, um, but I know that I've heard it being called a zebra crossing. Interesting, right? Mm hmm. So. Um, it's a light that flashes on and off and it makes your car look like it's blinking at you. So blinker makes sense when you think about it, but indicators, they're indicators. Instead, they're your indicators. If, turn on your indicators if you're in the, in oh, okay. the, the Seems UK. like blinker is the lazier version of that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like, what does it do? It blinks. blinks. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We're real original. Little on the nose. What does she? Um, so, um. It's called a station wagon because it's for taking all your family to the station for the train they'll take on holiday, right? In the UK, it's an estate car because it's got room for everything from your country estate, maybe. It sounds a lot fancier in the UK. <laughs> I don't yep. think of a station wagon as being high end. Also, the one they have in the picture looks much nicer than probably American station wagons. Is that Renault? Is that the Renault badge? Uh, I don't, I don't know. know. It looks a lot more upscale than an American one. Oh, yeah. Pretty posh. Not a beater. So where four roads intersect, um, or is it where two roads cross one another? Whichever you choose, it'll be an intersection or a crossroads. So, so this is like the one that everybody's aligned on. Yeah, I suspect. This is a hood. It's the bonnet. Right, so in the UK and to the Brits, it's a bonnet. So that's interesting because both are attire words, bonnet and boot. Oh yeah. Huh? Oh, what is it called in the the glove box? It isn't called the glove box. I oh, thought that, that's right. I thought it's called the boot. Hmm. Let me we'll see if I can one. find it. So your rough around the edges project car isn't a beater if it's in the UK. Instead, it's a banger. And uh, you even use that rust bucket to go banger racing, if you like. So they call beaters bangers. But I eat bangers and mash. I don't eat a beater. By the way, the British term is cubby box, but there's probably other words. Really? I thought it was called the boot. Okay. I knew that the trunk was, but all right, let's keep going. So roundabout, they're called a roundabout because the traffic goes roundabout. Sure, the traffic goes in a circle, but it's actually called a roundabout. I agree. Traffic circle is uh, like a clinical term. And, and this in is the, the US, size. I would say they use the term roundabout, even though most people don't have roundabouts near them in the US. Yeah. This is the size a roundabout should be, not the stuff that we actually have around here. All right, let's keep going. We don't have any roundabouts in uh, uh, Omtown because everything is uh, self-driving and it goes like Mach 6 because it's all um, very capable AI. Anyway, uh, the idle sound is uh, not idle. It's called tick over. Okay, so is it if you're of a sound it makes or something, or is I guess. that like what the clock does? The ticking sound your car makes while it's sad and neutral. Eesh. All right. Well, there's five more. Y'all can go and check it out. Um, over at Jalopnik, leave a little bit for everybody else to go and review. In Britain, however, it's called the slip road, pal, not an off ramp. Interesting. Yeah. So our last article is 20 of the most boring cars ever made, and we won't be able to spend a lot of time on this one. Not all cars are heart-stoppingly exciting for 99% of the population. A car is just something to get folks from point A to point B, and there's nothing really wrong with that if you like dull and boring cars. So there are hundreds, if not thousands, of them out there. So the author of this over at QZ or Quartz put this article together. 20 of the most boring cars ever made. Andy Kolmowitz put the article together. They're from Jalopnik, but it's posted over at QZ.com. We're going to start this slideshow and take a look at them. 
Okay, that, that one does look boring. That Ford Tempo. Boy, sexy. So Ford Tempo, Nissan Versa, Plymouth Sundance, Chevy Malibu, K cars. It says none of them. I don't know what that is. Uh, Nissan Rogue, Chevy Cor Corvette C8, really? Chevy Aveo, Oldsmobile Cutlass, Dodge Neon, Kia Cephia, or Cephia. I don't know how it's pronounced. It's Cephia. Nithon, Nithon? Nithon Pathfinder. Nissan Pathfinder. Mazda Protege. Alfa Romeo Arna. Toyota Echo. Nissan Murano. Geo Metro. Chevy Celebrity and Chevy Trax. Never even heard of Chevy Celebrity. Which one do you want to look yeah, at? Yeah, a lot of these are not necessarily well known. Let's look at the Chevy Corvette C8 because I'm surprised to see a Corvette on here. That's a boring car. I don't consider that a boring car compared to probably every sedan, SUV, etc. I was like, maybe it doesn't look like a Corvette or something. Guys, it says, guys, boring is relative. First off, the misogyny is rife with this one. Um, if you lived in a town where nobody owned a car, the person with the Corolla automatically has the most exciting car. Likewise, if you're in a group of people where everyone owns a Ferrari, your Miata, which is by no stretch of the imagination boring, becomes the least interesting. But I hate to tell you, Miatas are kind of boring. I mean, okay, I'll just leave it alone. That's subjective. Anyway, again, very so subjective. So is this for this particular um, type of car? This one is considered the boring one. What if everybody has a Chevy I Corvette know. C8? I don't think it's a boring car. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't like this. It's a C8 Corvette. It's not boring, but you have to be pretty boring to own one. And if you are what you eat, you are most certainly what you drive. Submitted by Lil Xanos, who thinks that a Corvette, this kind of Corvette looks as close to a Ferrari or Lamborghini as you can get. But isn't as good as one or whatever. Well, compared to probably 90% plus of the population, this is probably a more exciting car than they will ever drive. Yeah, for sure. Okay, pick another. Okay, how about the Toyota Echo, which I don't think I've heard of. Oh, boy. Oh, oh that God. is super boring. Now, this one nailed it, right? <laughs> Oh like my this god. Is more boring than a sedan even seems, right? Like you probably think of what a sedan looks like. This is worse. It's like they took a full-size car and drove it into a wall. It That's looks exactly like exactly it. It like smushed on the front, but not the back. It's the pug of vehicles. It looks like they stole the front clip of a vehicle and super glued it onto the front of, uh, like a, uh, no, I don't even know. I was going to say that. I don't that even know. Cause then you're going to make it sound better than it is. Right. The Ford Tempo I thought was pretty darn boring, but I would take that over as with an echo. It's, it's like they took, there it is. So the Dodge That's Neon has the same stubby nose. That's the one that I was looking for, the Dodge Neon. But at Neon. least the car kind of fits like it. And it's pretty boring, I have to admit, but it looks way better than this one. That's what it is. They took the 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 front clip of something and stuck it onto a Toyota Corolla. Yeah, I think that's fair. And a Corolla isn't typically a really exciting car either. Right. Yeah, but I it didn't know. even make the list, so that gives you some idea. Other than the Corvette anomaly, Ooh. oh yeah, that's really boring. <laughs> so Plymouth Sundance. <laughs> I think most of this list is pretty spot on. Yeah, but they got that one. That I mean, Nissan Pathfinder. Yeah, I mean it's. It a doesn't crossover. have anything that really stands out, right? It's not right. like it's bad. It's just. Why buy that one over something else? I wonder how many submissions they actually got. Because they're actually named by people. Right. Nissan Rogue. Maybe if they gave decent comments, they ended up using it. 
Right, right, right. So what is this? Sh oh, God. <laughs> that is horrible. <laughs> it's like an 80s style police car. Police car. Yeah. <laughs> but without even the police markings or whatever. Let's see. It's titled or the, the caption under this Chevy celebrity <clears throat> got the job done, was actually pretty comfortable. Don't think a celebrity ever owned one. It was pretty comfortable because it had enough room for a queen size yeah, bed. It was like a boat. <laughs> when it yeah. got too close to water, a propeller would descend from the back with aspirations to go drown itself in the in the ocean. Dear God. This is really bad. I don't know what this is. Oh. What? Dodge Aries K. It says there must have been like cars. a line of K. Oh, this is pretty bad. Oh, yeah. But this is all from that same era, the late the 80s. Um, wow. All right, folks. Well, we can't all be looking at these 20 of the most boring cars forever. So let's get out of here. Ah, oh, going to try and restart this car. OK, we're back at the. Which one was it? <laughs> anything by the 80s. By way of the 80s, and we're back to the front page of Four Wheel Tech over at hometown.com. And uh, that's it for today's shows. We're all done. Yay. I am Merwat, and the sentient AI is going to, uh, I don't know, put the pedal to the metal and. Uh, vroom? Yeah, oh, vroom. There you go. Vroom, I can't vroom. do two vrooms. <laughs> vroom, vroom, vroom. Oh, now there we have. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, good night, hometown citizens. Thanks for joining us for Four Wheel Tech. Hopefully you're not driving a car that was on that list. Uh, th I keep thinking that you're going to say something else, but you don't. OK, well, we're out of here. See you later. I'm getting out of here. Bye bye.